everyone, welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John DeTulio. And I'm Kristen Clack. Despite some early season ups and downs, the RIT men's hockey team is in the thick of the playoff chase in the Atlantic Hockey Association after going unbeaten in seven of their last nine games. Well, the Tigers entered the final weekend of January tied for eighth in the AHA standings, but remarkably just three points out of second place. Everyone in the league chasing Niagara, who has gone on an incredible 13-1-1 run in conference so far this year. 17th ranked Purple Eagles visiting Ritter for the first and only time this year. We pick it up in the third. Tigers on the power play. Mike Kolovecki with the blast that finds its way through. RIT ties the game at two. But Niagara answers right back with a two-on-one break. Dan Kalenda to Ryan Rashid for a second of the night. The Purple Eagles grab a 3-2 lead. It's the second goal of the night for Rashid, and Niagara takes the lead back. Late third now, Tigers still trailing. Brad Shumway with the wrister to beat Carson Chubach. Shumway's first collegiate goal tied the game at three and set us to overtime. Now, RIT had their chances in the extra session, but did not capitalize. Jeff Smith robbed by Chubach. RIT and Niagara skate to a three-all tie. With more, here's SportsZone's Lauren McShane. In a tough conference game, RIT faced number one team, Niagara. Despite being down for most of the game, they managed to tie it late in the third. One of the rare times Niagara fell asleep, but no! There's the goal! We are tied at three! And what a time for Brad Shumway to come up with his first collegiate goal! Now, do you see tying as a sort of disappointment? Uh. Not really. I mean, we always want to win the games, but I mean, like, especially in this league with everyone so close, you know, every point matters. So, you know, we'll take any points we can get, that's for sure. You know, I, I think um, particularly when you're the team that tied the game, I, I think there's a little bit different feeling than if they were to tie us. Uh, so I think uh, you ended a little bit more positive when you, you tie someone. Tonight, no, because we were down 3-2 with the last couple minutes left and we were able to tie it, so I think we have a better feeling about getting the tie. But uh, then again, we missed some uh, opportunities that just didn't work out our way, so we know that we can uh, be better tomorrow night. Now, what is it about Niagara that makes them such a tough team to beat? Well, they, you know, they've got good goaltending, their defense are big and strong and move the puck, uh, and uh, they've got some very dynamic forwards. So I think all those uh, things make, make them a good team. And, uh, you know, they've only got one loss in league play, so they're, they're there for a reason, and uh, we certainly respect that, but we, we think we're right on par with them, and we look forward for tomorrow's challenge. Well, first of all, their goalie's a really good player, and um, he's tough to score against, that's one. And then they work the puck really well down low, so they control the puck really well and get shots. But, but overall, you know, we match pretty well against them, I think. You know, it's always going to be back and forth, and, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, so. With Niagara's goalie being so good, how tough is it to know that you can't really let any goals slip by? I mean, it's tough in general against this team. Um, they're a really good team. They have good offense, good defense, and good goaltending. They're pretty much uh, the total package right now, and uh, there's a reason why they're so high up in the standings. Um, but their goalie, he's, um, he's beatable, but I know on the other end that I need to stay there and uh, do my job and control the game. What do you think the team will take away from this game? That we just have to work extremely hard. You know, we worked hard tonight, but uh, it was only good enough for a tie, and the previous game that we played them was only good enough for a tie. They've only been beat once in the league. So uh, we need to work twice as hard as we did tonight to get the win. I think that we left a little bit out there. I mean, we definitely battled hard. It was nice to have a little bit of a comeback. Shows that the boys were resilient. But we'll be ready to go for, uh, for tomorrow and a little more energy and uh, taking advantage of uh, some of our uh, situations and we'll put the puck in the net and win. Niagara beat the Tigers 6-4 the following night, so RIT remains in eighth place in the conference standings tied with Connecticut. Speaking of the Huskies, our next live broadcast of men's hockey comes up February 1st and 2nd when the Tigers host UConn at Ritter Arena, followed by a pair of games with rival Air Force on the 22nd and 23rd. All Sports Zone live games can be seen on Time Warner Cable Sports Channel and a complete TV schedule can be found at RITSE.com. Welcome back to Sports Zone. He led the Tigers to the Frozen Four in 2010 and went on to play professionally in the AHL and ECHL. After hanging up the skates, he returned to the Brick City and helped guide the Lady Tigers to the program's first national championship last March. And now, as Kristen Clock reports, Jared DeMichael is in the process of helping build a brand new Division III program right across town. Go. 
So what made you decide to get into coaching? Um, well, actually at RIT, I had a pretty good experience there with the coaches, uh, Coach Wilson, Coach Hills, Coach Insulaco, uh Coach Jermaine, as well as Coach Chris Line, who was there my sophomore year. Um, I had a really good experience with them and learned a lot and uh, saw the positive influence that they had on us as a team and me personally. And uh, I felt that if I had the opportunity to get into coaching that I could have the same type of uh, input on potential young athletes and kind of wanted to get involved in it from there. So how have your experiences with RIT going to the Frozen Four and then in the ECHL helped you as a coach now? It, it definitely helped immensely. I mean, uh, a lot of the things that we do that we did at RIT are comparable to what I do here at Nazareth. At the same time, a lot of the drills that I did, uh, whether it be at the NHL training camps or the AHL team or ECHL teams, um, did a lot of different drills there, still development things that I can pass on here, whether it be to the forwards or the defensemen, uh, special teams, obviously me being a goalie, I have a, an expertise there from being a goalie that I can help out with the goalies, but uh, when, you, when you stand in that goal for 60 minutes, you get to see a lot of stuff, which kind of lets you allows you to work with everybody on the ice. So how did you come to get the NAS job? Um, I was actually playing pro last year in uh, September, November, and uh, in late October I kind of started to bounce around um, and in the summer I contacted the RIT coaches saying that I was interested in getting the coaches if I was going to be a suitcase and pro. Uh, I kind of knew the writing on the wall that it was going to be a tough year for me. Um, after one of the places that I got released from, uh, Coach Wilson let me know that Coach Roll was starting a program at Nazareth, said it might be a nice place to break in and uh, met with Coach Roll and uh, saw the program that, was, was, that they were building and I wanted to be a part of it. And uh, then after that, uh, Coach McDonald contacted me and knew that the team wasn't going to start until this year. So last season, um, I was able to recruit, get kids on campus at Nazareth. Then around 2 or 3 o'clock, I'd head over to RIT, help with the women's practice, go over film with the girls, and then I tried to make as many of the girls games as possible last year. What do you like about coaching? Um, I think first and foremost that you're still around the game, still around the guys and whatnot. Um, I, I, and as a college coach, I really enjoy the recruiting. I'm not afraid to go out on the road and watch games. It's, it's interesting to watch the up-and-coming players and where they end up and how they translate to the college game. Um, the practices are always really fun, seeing guys improve uh, with our team here at Nazareth being a first-year program. The guys have improved immensely, um, so that's been really interesting. So all those types of things have made coaching pretty fun so far. So what do you think the most difficult part about the job is? Um, I think it's the hours that you put in that nobody really sees, uh, doing the little things that not a lot of people notice, like uh, obviously breaking down film takes a lot of time, but doing things with players one-on-one. -on -one. Um, even game day, um, whether it be here at Nazareth, because there's been times where I put pucks up on for warm-ups, I put the pegs in the net, um, I take care of the ticket sheet, which people don't probably really think that I do. I mean, little stuff like that. Uh, obviously on the road, too, there's a lot of mornings where I'm getting back at 2 or 3 in the morning where I'll go up to Canada, I'll watch a game, or be in Boston or Philadelphia. Um, I think a lot of people just think you, you coach and that's about it, but there's a lot more that goes into it than meets the eye. So do you think coaching is what you always want to do? Um, growing up, I, I don't think I, I thought about being a coach, but then around my sophomore, junior year at RIT, going into my senior year, I definitely thought it was something that I'd, I could do. Um, I saw the hours that our coaches put in at RIT, and I knew all the hard work that they put in, and uh, I knew if I want to be a successful coach, I have to put in those same type of hours, and I'm not really afraid to, to do that. As a player, um, I put in a lot of extra time, and I know as a coach to be successful, you have to put in that extra time. So uh, it's not something that I, I dreamed of, but right now I, I'm, I'm completely happy doing this and I can't think about doing anything else besides being a coach. Ellie Bennington's first season at RIT was nearly perfect. As a backup, she stopped 94% of the shots she faced on her way to a 10-0 record and a national championship. This year, Division I has been a bit of an adjustment, but as Emily Clark reports, the girl who always wanted to play goaltender has been up to the challenge thus far. Opportunity, here's a breakaway for Colgate, walking in on Bennington, going and Bennington with a pad save on Simpson. So can you tell me a little bit about how you chose goalie as your position and when you started playing hockey? Uh, I started playing hockey when I was maybe four or five years old. I didn't start off as goalie right away. I played my first year as just rotating positions. And my older brother's a goalie and he's six years older than me. So he was kind of already into the position. And the one day I just went into the arena and dragged his equipment in with me and went up to the coach and I was like, I want to be a goalie. 
for the rest of this year, so he let me. My mom wasn't too happy about it, but having two goalies in the family, so that's kind of how I got into it. And just when I was younger, growing up with two older brothers, I they were constantly strapping equipment on me and just kind of firing pucks at me in the basement. So kind of got into it that way. I was all, always around the rink. My brother went to Northeastern, and that kind of set off my desire to come play collegiate hockey down in the States. I came for my visit. I came down on the blackout weekend when they were playing against Plattsburgh, mm -hmm. and that was a great game to watch. I got to see a great atmosphere. I loved the rink, loved everything that was going on, loved campus. They had my major, so I really wanted to come here from that game, and then it's close to home. I'm from two and a half hours away, mm -hmm. so it was great for me to have the opportunity to have my family be able to come down to watch me play on weekends. So overall, just loved everything about the school when I came to visit. What was last year like? Laura was more of the main goalie. Um, you didn't play as much as you have been playing. Did you, was it frustrating having to kind of sit and watch or were you content knowing that you would get your chance? Well, coming in as a freshman, you don't really expect to play that much, especially as a goalie. Mm -hmm. Coming in behind Laura, she had a great freshman year, led the team all the way to the finals of the NCAAs. So I knew coming in that I was gonna be, I was gonna be battling for playing time. And I got pretty lucky. I got to play in 10 games last year and a couple of exhibition games too. So I knew that I'd get my shot and get to kind of prove myself and kind of just waited for that opportunity. Do you feel like there's competition between you two or is it more just for the sake of the team? Uh, I think there's definitely competition between us as goalies. There always is between goaltenders. You're fighting for minutes, but we kind of build off of each other's success. If one goalie's playing well, the other kind of picks up their game and vice versa. So I think it's, it's really good. We're both pushing each other. How reassuring is it to know that you have Laura and you have Allie and you're at the D1 level comfortable with two goalies? And that was kind of the game plan heading into uh, Allie's freshman year and uh, the national championship years. We had two goalies that we could rely on for any game and it, it was kind of flip of a coin of uh, who's hot, who's, who we kind of go with that game and uh, we went with Laura that, uh, that, that year and then uh, but we knew each one was capable and it, it certainly makes you know, when you have two capable goalies, it makes for an easy decision, but it's a tough one because you're sitting out a quality goaltender as well. Quick shot at save made by Vinnington. What do you feel like is really working for you since you're doing so good, and where do you think you maybe still need to improve? Um, I think I'm still trying to improve the mental aspect of the game and kind of preparation because I think I, along with all the other girls on our team, we all have the physical set of skills to be here, and we're all here for a reason. But the mental aspect of it, I think, is the most important part, and that's what I need to develop. It's being able to recover after getting a goal scored on you. Like, the girls are so talented, you're going to get scored on in games. And I think for me, that's the biggest part that I need to improve, is being able to kind of recover from that and stay focused and be able to play a full 60 minutes every night. What do you think the pressure is like for a D1 goalie, and how is it different from when they were at the D3 level? Um, I think there's more, a lot more pressure. You have better shooters coming at you. Um, they're facing a lot more shots now than what they're used to. Um, but to be honest, I think they actually enjoy getting more shots. So it's a different kind of pressure where um, you're forced to be in the game right away, and if you're not uh, mentally there, then you get exposed really quick, and uh, you know, there's no hiding mistakes when it's a goalie mistake. I always replay those moments in my head, even like the night after a game, I'll be thinking about it all the time. And during the game, you just have to kind of put that behind you and kind of just keep going, focusing on what's going to happen and the future shots to come rather than dwelling on the last goal. It's over with. And like we say, find it, fix it, forget it. You just got to put it out of your mind and continue on with the game. Do you feel like you've really been forced to step up, like the team is relying on you in a new way versus before? I feel like they are relying on me a little bit more because these games are so much closer, especially in Division One. The games are one goal games. and you have to be on your game for the full 60 minutes. So I think they rely on like the goaltenders to make those initial saves and make those big saves to keep the games close so that we can try to win as many games as possible. 16 saves today for Allie Bennington and the RIT Tigers get the win. Welcome back to Sports Zone. It's a record that has stood since 1976. But as Melissa Bromley reports, after 36 years, an RIT sophomore finally equaled Willie Barkley's record-setting high jump of 2.03 meters. Nice! Oh, you got 
When did you first start high jumping? Um, I started track in general and high jump uh, my junior year of high school. I started out as a shot putter and then I found out I was much better at high jump. So I just sort of focused more of my attention towards that. You guys make high jump look so easy. What do you find is really difficult about it? I feel like the most difficult part for me was uh, just learning like the arc, the, just the timing of it. Like you have to be very patient in the air, but everything happens in like milliseconds. So it's all about muscle memory and just sort of keeping practicing, you know? I think that pinpointing a hardest part of the high jump, being as that it is such a complex activity, it would probably be, you know, the athlete's body awareness. An athlete being able to say during the process, this is what, you know, I did wrong. Uh, I felt that, you know, my legs were too long or something along those lines. Would you say that high jump is kind of more mentally demanding or is it all about the technique? Yeah, I usually get pretty nervous. Um, I try to clear it out all before I jump and like before when I'm warming up, I'm like a lot of stuff's going through my head, but when I come up to the apron, it's sort of like try to clear everything out. I would say that it's definitely mentally demanding, especially because in high jump you always fail. Like you never just like get your best and then stop. Like you, uh, you have to keep getting higher and higher until you, you fail, until you fail three times. He's very calm under pressure, uh, very focused, very compartmentalized in his life as well as you know in his athletic career. He's stayed humble throughout the whole process, so that's actually been something really positive for me to see in this day and age of you know all of the me athletes that you see on TV. It's just very special to see someone of his age demographic be so humble about doing this. Nice! Very good. And he didn't penetrate a lot because he actually drove and created space. That's very good. What was it like tying this 36-year-long record? Um, it was sort of bittersweet. Obviously, I'm ecstatic about you know tying a, such an old record, but just being one centimeter away from actually breaking it is sort of, you know. When Jamie came here, did you think that something like this would be possible and think that he might be able to reach such a high level? I did actually. We offered him a very strong infrastructure. We had a support system in place with you know coaches, athletic training staff, strength and conditioning, our facility. Uh, the fact that I've been fortunate enough to coach a national champion before, so I've had the experience. Uh, I think that there was just a lot of support for him to be able to do that. So, you know, when he came to me and said, this is what I've done in high school, this is what I want to do, uh, I certainly think that that's attainable, and then more. I think that there's more that he doesn't even know yet that he's able to obtain that I can kind of see. What do you think you have to do to break that record, and do you think you'll be able to? Um, yeah, I think I'll be able to. Um, it's still early in the season, which is good. Um, I think if I just keep lifting and going to practice, staying, on, staying focused, it should just come. Well, I think that whenever you talk about you know, growth, I think it early on in the process, a lot of times you get substantial growth. Uh, and then as the process goes on, it becomes a little more incremental. Being able to stay focused and stay determined through some ups and downs or through some less substantial height changes uh, is gonna be very difficult. Because it's you want the world every time you go out and jump, but you have to realize that everything is a process. He's pretty good at staying motivated himself. I think uh, making sure that he has got that competitive fire lit all the time. You know, I'm always trying to tell him there's somebody else out there right now that's willing to do the work. There's someone else out there right now who is thinking about beating you. Um, so I think on the competitive side of things, just really keeping his fire lit is just gonna help a lot. The biggest thing for me is um, when the bar goes up, like for higher heights, you have to back up your approach. And so uh, you have to jump farther away from the mat. And I've been very intimidated by that. Like, I think I'm just going to jump and then fall straight back down. So I have to mentally get over that block to, to push myself to like the 6'10", 6'11 heights. He jumped 6'9 uh, in outdoor season last year, uh, which is his career personal best. But this year, he jumped 6'8 in the indoor season to tie the record. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, seven feet's not out of the question for Jamie. My goal by the end of my college career is seven feet. So just to get that seven foot mark would be amazing. While staying connected to SportsZone is now easier than ever thanks to the all new RIT SportsZone app. Catch up on the games and episodes you've missed and discover so much more. It's a must have for all Tiger fanatics, so download the RIT SportsZone app for your Android or Apple device today. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT SportsZone. So until next time, thanks for joining us here in the zone.